right? So excited to be here, seeing David once again after a few years, <laughs> and all the others too. Uh, so the stuff I'm presenting today is joint work with a bunch of other people spread across University of Washington and uh, TU Munich. Um, so, I'll, so basically what we're introducing is essentially um, using FireDrake as a simulation engine. We have, we have a scientific reinforcement learning framework which essentially implements a set of first environments as it's sort of like the first release and there are many more steps to come. Um, I'll first introduce why we're doing this, how sort of the framework design, what it looks like, what are the, um, there's some inherent limitations in there that we had to make, but um, you'll probably see them, or if not, I'm happy to answer all your questions around that. The first, the set of first environments, like how we are, curr like we are currently benchmarking on the supercomputer in, the, in Seattle to basically finish this off, uh, what we have planned for the future, and then just to conclude, and always happy to take any questions along the way, so please butt in if you have any questions. So essentially, um, flow control is quite important, as probably a few other of you are also working with flow control problems. And many more people have in recent years started to look at this using reinforcement learning. The, the downside of a lot of the work that is currently being done is that a lot of them either implement in their own solver, or it's, like, it's just a one-off prototype, which is like a monolith, and you can't really reproduce it. And a lot of the modern reinforcement learning results sort of require you to not only look at one environment, but let's say cross train across five to ten, maybe sometimes twenty or sometimes up to six hundred environments for some algorithms. And that's just completely impossible if you have all these disparate environments. And you can also hardly compare the benchmarks because a lot of the benchmarks have differences in implementation, so we don't know which algorithm is actually better. Everyone will say, hey, my algorithm is the best, but like, is it actually true? We don't know, unless we sit down and actually reproduce the entire thing. So, so part of the goal is also is like to make some of these results more comparable, more reproducible, and that people, if you just sit down and look at it, you can just spin it up on your laptop and, um, I mean, reinforcement learning is quite expensive, but like, you can theory reproduce it. And like a lot of the insight here is also drawn from the more core robotics or reinforcement research, it's called like, uh, Jack's based frameworks like Brax, for example, is pretty strong, and uh, NVIDIA has Isaac Jim, which is uh, running pretty well on NVIDIA GPUs, surprise, surprise. Um, and Drake is more of the robotic side, and Mujoko is sort of like the, the grand old man in the room in a way. And sort of like the long term, why would one want to push towards this? So more and more, more algorithms these days um, try to use a lot of these environments at the same time to have much more capable agents. So for example, this is one recent example called Gato, in short, or like they introduced generous agents and they trained across 600 environments, which right now in scientific reinforcement would be absolutely impossible because we don't have anywhere close to that in any framework. So uh, that's completely impossible, even if you'd have multiple groups working on it. And you also want to be able to utilize a lot of the other components, like let's say if you have a graph and network circuit, can we utilize this in the computation? And right now the answer is no. In CoreRL, they're already doing some stuff like that. The, the, the question is, how can we get there as well for scientific reinforcement learning? And so it's like, why would you even capture it? It's like, um, if you have a generalist agent in theory, like this purely theory, uh, you could just fine tune it with very little computation to a specific flow control application by pulling the weights from, let's say, off the, from like an offsite server. And you could probably do it with very few samples, um, but that's purely conjecture. No one has proven anyway, so uh, I will take that with a big grain of salt. So what does this sort of look like and where does FireDrake come from? So essentially what we always have is we have the reinforcement learning controller, uh, which performs an action on the flow environment. And the flow control environment is a FireDrake. Um, and then what we have here is we have sort of this parallelization layer in between to basically be able to scale the reinforcement learning computation. We don't want to run just one environment. We have to run many environments at the same time to converge at a reasonable time. Then we have PyTorch on the other end in which the reinforcement learning is actually done. And PyTorch in here is purely just, we just did it in PyTorch. There's nothing speaking against any other machine learning framework. And then when you scale this, you just essentially run a whole host of environments at the same time. Uh, which is mostly just limited how many CPUs do you have available, how many GPUs do you have available to run reinforcement learning agents, and then you can just occupy the whole machine. Can you just or, explain what you mean by environment in this flow control setup? So it be in different, different geometries and... 
Students. So we, we have to fix a bunch of geometry most mm -hmm. often. So and then in here, for example, you can you control, let's say, um, for example, in a rotating cylinder, you control the rotation, which is compared to very positive radiation. If you, if you perform a certain action, you have to perform a simulation, and you have to get the control output that you actually care about the characterization at the end. And then you would run, so basically, the reinforcement agent might issue, let's say, 100 actions at the same time. So it means that you have to run 100 environments at the same time, uh, each as their own simulation. That's part of the exploring the state space. Yes. Right. Okay. So it's a realization. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's no caching taken back. Like we cache what you ran, so you don't run anything twice, which, which the reinforcement agent does in theory sometimes do, but we don't cache the result per se. We just tell uh, like, hey, don't do this twice. So um, we have essentially have three components. Um, there's sort of this uh, gym API, which used to be its own thing inside of OpenAI, and now it's in its own foundation. And we sort of comply with that, and we have an extension about that for PD control problems, which I'll show you in a second, which just introduces some of the logic you need for PD control. Uh, we have the environment definitions, which are talking to the backend, backend PD solver, in this case, FireDrake's Python API. And then we have the distributed computation taking place where we utilize a lot of Docker um, and a lot of Ray to just scale it up. So below it we have um, always the configuration of the dynamics model with the flow configuration and we have to have the certain logic they implemented and then on top of it is the flow environment. And that specifically looks like this. So these are the three components governed by the uh, more general RL API. So you need to be able to get initial state, you need to be able to get an observation and perform an action, and you need to be able to evaluate the control objective so that you have the environment sort of uh, defined. And then we introduce another four uh, conditions that we need specifically for PDE control, which is the extension that we provide. And um, yeah, that's essentially how you can, if you'd want to, implement your own environment into it. And then, once you want to look at the core problem, everything is very Pythonic and quite compliant with the normal way you define RL computation in PyTorch. And so, the Pythonic API, in a way, just follows a lot of the existing design, to be honest. It's not trying to do anything completely novel there. Um, mostly also because we want to be able to allow the users to just use any PyTorch-based RL library that you kind of prefer. I mean, there are a lot of them. People have their own preferences, and we don't want to constrain the choice there. And mostly just JAX is untested, to be honest, so uh, might also work with JAX if you've never tested it. We mostly use RLlib, but we also tested the minor test with Torch RL and CleanRL, which are two other big ones. And there also exist other ones which are not listed here, but uh, I'm happy to talk offline if you want to talk about RL libraries. <laughs> Uh, so initially, our initial set is four environments that are very difficulty. So we have a rotating cylinder, we have a chaotic pinball, which is just uh, essentially three cylinders in a triangle setup. We have a shear driven cavity and we have a facing step so far, which are quite varying in terms of the, how much compute they take. And we always provide, I think sort of addressing a bit of Colin's earlier question, a cause mesh if you just want to quickly test things out which the results will not, probably not look very good, but you can just test things out quickly and the computation will be fast. And we provide also a medium fidelity and a fine mesh if you really want to fully resolve the flow control problem. So rotating uh, cylinder essentially follows the implementation um, put forth by a lot of other flow control problems like uh, NOAC, I think, started it, and then there's a little bit of extension since that. And the reason why we do this is we like that it has a lot of the several characteristics that you also see in more complex flows. So it's a very simple example to start off with. And also, by now, it has been used in flow control a lot. Um, I think I, I still keep seeing JFM papers where they just do that for rotating cylinder. And I don't know, maybe it's time to move to different problems. But you could still keep seeing it pop up for RL for flow control a lot. And the goal here is drag minimization, and you can basically just uh, actuate the uh, rotation. The chaotic pinball uh, is uh, multi-input, multi-output, um, has more complex, more complex dynamics, and essentially we can also tune the difficulty of the flow control problem for the somewhere here. And then we have the shear driven cavity, which also um, 
I mean, uh, so the, the lab itself runs Steven does a lot of uh, reduced order models, so that's also some of the background why a lot of these problems are chosen that way, to be honest. Um, we just follow literature here again, um, and some of the more complex heuristic, but a single input, single output, um, but it's more complex in a way. And then we have the real fussing step, which a sort of uh, amplifier, and it's convectively unstable. And we just want to minimize the fluctuation kinetic energy here, essentially. And um, so to just, like, if you just look at the high level, what, do, what does this mean? Um, so the observation dimensions, if we just look at it from a high level, like how good is this flow control uh, or the uh, environment library? So in all honesty, like we are not providing very high dimension in the observation and actuation dimension so far. So all of the problems that we're doing so far are quite low from an RL person's perspective, dimensionality, but um, that's something we look to address and I'll also talk about in future work. And yeah, that's sort of the, the downside of what we currently have. So the current status is like we're running all the experiments on uh, Hayek in Seattle. And so we're testing, so basically all we're looking to show in the initial paper is just that the environments work and the algorithms work. It's not showing any insane performance or something. It's just that it works and if you use it, you will, you'll have the typical RL uh, performance. And we're essentially testing with proximal policy optimization, soft actor critics, evolutionary research as a comparison point, and an algorithm called Streamer, which essentially is, uh, has a world model inside of it, um, which is slightly different in terms of construction to other RL and uh, algorithms. So what's there to do in the future? Uh, so, um, I mean, everything I'm talking about is open source. If you look at the uh, Dynamics Lab GitHub, um, you'll find hydrogen there. You can just download it and use it. Um, we're looking to heavily extend the set of environments and we're actually working on that for other research groups to provide a much wider variety of low control problems to also address these weaknesses in terms of the action dimension of the observation dimension. And probably in that, in the process of that, we'll probably also include source which are not fired exactly because it's, uh, we also want to be able to take some of the RL prop flow control problems they did by just essentially pulling in their solver providing a Docker container and uh, yeah. uh, broaden the benchmarking. Right now it's just for RL environments with RL algorithms, which is not a lot. So we are looking at potentially keeping it running and just benchmark all the other RL algorithms while we add it. And uh, we'll most likely be maintaining it on the leaderboard and there will also be some announcement with regards to that around APS. So where people can actually submit their uh, control results on there and we will maintain the board and there's also some computation collaboration there if people don't have the computer. So. Uh, also, um, a big thing in RL these days is that you essentially just want to minimize your data movement inside of the RL as much as possible. So people just try to compile as much of it onto a GPU. Um, right now, what we are capped by in a way is that we are running uh, Fire Drake on the CPU, and then we have to move the data onto the GPU for the R computation, perform some observation, get it back. Um, the question is, with all the work that I've seen here, in a way, is how close can we get to something more of a state which looks will not look like this, but would look closer to this? So uh, probably later I will talk in the theme about this um, and see what uh, how the patch integration might help with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what we're introducing is basically a initial set of four environments. Um, it scales um, through Ray. Um, it's industry standard, everything is stable, so it scales on supercomputers as well in the cloud. Um, we're benchmarking with four first reinforcement learning algorithms, and in the future we will add a lot more environments, um, more expensive RL benchmarking, and also probably provide a lot of performance improvements in the process um, by just optimizing a lot. Um, yeah. This linger rotation is forced or is free? It's forced. It's forced. And um, how, how is the, the, the methodology to that we compute the control to, to have a control analysis? Do you, do you use sensitivity analysis? 
nuns? Uh, no, I don't think we use this issue. That's how you, do you became, uh, how you make your poems go announced? I, I would actually, I think, I, I didn't write that specific environment, so I'd have to look at the coach. I don't want to give the wrong answer here, um, but... Uh, and uh, the control is based on linear analysis, only on linear analysis, or you, do you have control analysis in linear forms? So right now it's just linear analysis as far as I'm aware. So <clears throat> the problems you're showing are, um, with the exception maybe of the first one, already at a scale where they would benefit, like the PDE cell would benefit from being parallel. And as you move into more realistic examples, you get to the point where like, the PDE cell has to be parallel. No, so, no, we run the fire to the actually. Like, we run the PDE cell in parallel. So then I'm a little confused about how you're anticipating. So surely if you have different parallel framework for the PDE cell from what's going on in the machine learning world, the data transfer is the least of the worries. Um, we still have, we still incur a lot of latency for that, which is a bit annoying. So, um, but, I mean, in a way, it's the question there is how, how do you anticipate to run it? And right now, it's just like you need a massive CPU system. And the question is, in a way, long term, how can we get to something where we can run on GPU systems, which maybe is still fire rate, I don't know. And, um, Elementary question. So, is the goal to train one controller that can cope with different uh, flow problems? Is that why you're so, using so right, so right now, uh, it's always just like one controller for one environment. But the goal is that you actually then you want to control a uh, controller which runs across the different environments. Yeah. yeah. So you're sort of so it's the controller being updated simultaneously from from different. Okay. So the the goal. Yeah, just more, almost a comment really. Um, so what, what you're doing there looks a little bit like what the in-situ anal analytics and visualization people do, where they want to run a simulation and they want also to do something with the data that's coming out of it, and they distinguish between tightly coupled and loosely coupled. Loosely coupled is enormously easier than roughly what we're doing today. Uh, tightly coupled, uh, yeah, I'd love to be doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Control can be continuous in time, like force that you will have each time step. If you run the, the controller fully in the loop, then yes. I had a question if no one else had one. So, what's the kind of non trendy way of doing this? <laughs> and, and I asked because, like, in, in my experience, all the time. Being outside, converging reinforcement learning methods is tremendously difficult and it's very delicate. And so there's also a lot of hardware tuning always going on. So it's like it's um, there's definitely some uh, value in probably a future paper in comparing just classical control approaches to DRL. And my intuition there would be that maybe you can get tight-sided controls for RL, but the compute cost is just a lot higher. And that's sort of the, the main downside that IOS from RL still has a lot. There, there are ways, there are now ways uh, that sort of work around this called offline RL, where essentially you have, let's say you have a group which runs a lot of RL computation and you, you store your interaction trajectories in like an online cache, for example. Then let's say you pull it up and want to use it, you, you pull from the online cache and just mimic the, the behavior of the agent and it just then train a bit more. Then you have a lot lower cost, but if you train from scratch, as they say, it's very yeah. expensive. I mean, famously, Flybrake can give you gradients which you're not currently using. Would, it, would that help? There exists uh, a larger body of work with the French URL, um, which is sort of falling right now, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, the algorithm space for that is still very much sort of flux. And that it, yeah, but yes, it would help a lot. Like, yeah. those algorithms require a lot. Fewer interactions with the environments. So, yes, that's definitely something. So that, that's just like an open goal here, because that's kind of famously what Fiverr will give you, right? You can have that gradient. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, so I think, uh, just on this, but I think like, uh, fire grade grains also tend to be fairly stable, actually, compared to what a lot of other soils. Fire grade, what's the grade? The gradients through the simulation trajectory in fire grade tend to be a lot more stable than some other soils, which... I mean, we're, we're, we're computing the discrete actor and we're getting the right answer. If someone else gets the right answer, it's going to be the same as the one we get. Um, 